All right, so this is my first shots with the SIG Bravo 4 Battle Pack. Both of these are zeroed for 50 yards. This is, of course, a magnified optic, which is for 50 slash 200. Really hot out here. We've got a little white rock out there on the berm. It's about 100 yards. We're just going to use that as our target because even moving steel out here scorches you. So I'm going to start with the magnified optic, and then I'll move to the red dot. Hit. Reliable hits, no problem. Let's use the dot on top. Stacked optic. You may not be able to tell in the video, but those are there's a, maybe a miss or two, but the, that's hitting the rock with authority, whether using the red dot or the magnified optic. I'm going to go from back and forth for just a few more. Pounding that rock hard. In fact, it's kind of turning into dust already. It's getting crushed. As with all of these, this is sort of a chin weld, and this is a normal American type sighting system, but this isn't a problem for quick and up close. Not the biggest fan of stacked optics, but this is a neat little bundle. This is Russell Fagan, aka Sinister Rifleman, here for InRange TV to do a review of the Sig Sauer Bravo 4 Battle Pack. The Bravo 4 Battle Pack includes the Bravo 4 fixed four power combat style optic and the Romeo Zero red dot, which I've previously reviewed on in range in another video. I've already unboxed it off camera because this box was pretty tight to uh, get apart on camera. So in typical fashion, I'm going to go over the features, everything it comes with, and then we'll be doing an extended review over the course of multiple matches of how this optic works in practice. The Bravo 4 Battle Pack includes all the items you see here with an MSRP of $660. You have the main sight, the Romeo Zero, the steel shroud for the Romeo Zero, uh, a Torx wrench for removing the plate on top of the primary optic, Allen wrench for removing the base uh, mounting system of the optic, and the uh, accessory pack for the Romeo Zero. It does come with the lens caps installed. I'm going to be removing those to make it easier to show off the various features of the site as I talk about it. The Bravo 4 itself does have reticle illumination. It's powered by a single AA battery that's loaded into this compartment here. Uh, the cap for it is uh, dummy corded to the site itself with that little wire. Um, getting the cap open can be tricky because you got to make sure the wire doesn't twist too much as you're unscrewing the cap but I'll open that up so you can see how that works. But you notice I have to keep the dummy cord out of the way as I do so. So there's our single AA battery, loads in like that, and then we can tighten it back down. This is the brightness adjustment knob here. Let's count through the settings for that. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, uh, 11, as advertised brightness settings. The Bravo 4 does have an adjustable diopter so you can focus it to work best with your eyes and or corrective lenses. Uh, there's a jam nut to secure it in place once you have it focused but it does have a fairly wide range of adjustment for focusing. The windage and elevation adjustments are in half MOA increments. There are a total of 110 MOA available on each for zeroing. The markings on the scope say that it was designed by Sig Sauer in Oregon and manufactured in China. Uh, I believe they're denoting that they designed it in Oregon to differentiate it from other uh, PRISM sites on the market it's very common for the factories in China to make essentially the same optic with different uh, external features for multiple companies. And in this case, it appears that uh, SIG's design is simply being manufactured in China um, based on their own specifications. 
Knowing that this optic is made in China, the quality of the glass actually exceeds my expectations. Uh, it is on par with other optics I've used from Japanese and American-based manufacturers uh, in the same price range of say $500 to $800. So if you get one of these, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with how clear the glass is for the price point. I'm going to show installing the Romeo Zero now. There is a sealant sticker that goes on the protective shroud that you need to apply before mounting the Romeo Zero. Uh, the Romeo Zero uses a bottom loading uh, CR1632 battery uh, that's held in place when you screw it all together down to the holes on top of the optic. So first thing I need to do is remove this plate. You'll see the two mounting screw holes for the Romeo Zero are there. Maybe what I'll do is load this into the protective shroud first to keep the battery from dropping out and then line that all up. I'm going to use the two uh, M4 screws that come with it to attach it. I'm not going to tighten it down all the way until I have both screws in. Uh, there is thread locker on the screws already, so I don't need to worry about adding that to them to keep it from vibrating loose. So you can see the dot there it is the brightness adjustment for the romeo zero is the center button inside the lens uh, the romeo zero does have uh, motion sensor technology and it will shut off if the site is left idle uh, for a few minutes All right, you can see there the motion sensor technology turned it off. I'm gonna move it and you can see it pops right back on. Uh, SIG's manual says that it has an average runtime of 20,000 hours with one CR1632 battery. Um, hard for us to test in a review like this, uh, but given the motion sensor technology, I'll tend to take them at their word for it. A few other details on the Romeo Zero for those of you that didn't see the previous review. Uh, this particular optic is sold as standard on some of the uh, SIG P365 models. Uh, it does have a plastic body and a plastic lens, and it is advertised as uh, assembled in the USA. So some of the components in it are foreign sourced. So you've done a lot with the Bravo 4 Battle Pack. Right, I, I did my normal, use it over the course of like five different matches, different environments, uh, different target engagement distances, and ranges and um, got a pretty good impression of, of using it. Now this is kind of an old school solution, right? We saw it back in the day and still see people with ACOGs and RMRs on top. Mm -hmm. And those come in at like, what, a thousand, eleven hundred bucks? Or more. Or more, even today for an ACOG stacked optic system. Mm -hmm. The Bravo 4 Battle Pack's MSRP is like, what, six something? Six sixty. That's, that's half the price. 
Now, the yeah. big difference is what? Uh, well, it is made in China. This is for, a Chinese optic. For those that care about it. The mm -hmm. Romeo Zero is uh, made in the USA, but the main optic is made in China. Uh, that said, as I mentioned earlier in the video, uh, the glass quality is better than I would expect. It's quite good, I would say. I would agree. And you can actually focus it. Yep. Which you don't do with an ACOG. Right. Yeah. So, uh, I tend to like stacked optics for having a secondary red dot more than an offset as a left-handed shooter okay. for a few different reasons. One is that uh, stage design bias is inherently right-handed, so there is very rarely an opportunity where it's advantageous for me to use a offset red dot as a left-handed shooter. Um, and I need to be able to shoot off both shoulders pretty regularly mm -hmm. uh, based on stage design. Um, so there's that. And the other thing is that offsetting a red dot um, left-handed configuration often blocks access to either the controls uh, for windage and elevation or the battery compartment itself. So it kind of defeats the purpose. So stacked optics is something I've done for a while if I do want a secondary sighting system. Okay. Uh, that said, uh, I did use the main optic like BAC style pretty regularly uh -huh. and that was easy to do because the eye relief is pretty uh, generous and the field of view through this thing is actually really good too. Explain BAC style to the audience. So that's shooting with both eyes open you have the reticle kind of superimposed over your vision um, but uh, you're not really seeing the magnified view because you're transitioning target to target you're just you know putting the big horseshoe in there over the target superimposed in your secondary eye one eye sees the unmagnified view in this eye which sees the mag or for you the other way around right one eye, the, the eye that sees the unmagnified views becomes the prominent primary and you just kind of superimpose the reticle it's called the bin to naming concept right okay does this have a magnified reticle i mean excuse me illuminated reticle it does but it does not work in the arizona sun it's not bright enough no so if it's if it's overcast or if it's low light it, it works for that it does use a single uh double a battery for that purpose okay um and that is really my own, there's only two gripes I really have with this thing. One is I wish the battery uh, allowed for uh, daylight illumination in Arizona, yep. uh, but not critical, particularly for the price point. And I, the center dot in this, inside the horseshoe, is really, really fine. I mm -hmm. believe it's a half MOA. Okay. And it was kind of hard for my eye to pick it up sometimes under different conditions. If that was actively illuminated, uh, I wouldn't care that it was so small. Um, so what I ended up doing a lot of the time was bracketing targets with a horseshoe mm. and shooting into the void. So which the still, dot kind of disappeared on the target. Correct. Yeah, okay. So it still worked out pretty good once I got used to aiming that way. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things that always comes into play with these optics reviews is familiarity. Mm -hmm. Like the more familiar I got with it, the easier it was to use and the easier it was to shoot accurately with it, right? And I didn't really mind that aiming style once I got used to it. Okay. Um, how'd the center dot look to you looking through it? very tiny almost pinprick sized right so that and the lack of active daylight illumination um, are really my only two gripes with it otherwise the massive field of view yeah. at distance uh, makes transitioning target to target easier it is a very wide field of view um, and that really comes into play when we have multiple steel target engagements if you can always see the next target you're moving to mm -hmm. it's that much easier to transition from a practical standpoint, if you're uh, zoned in on a particular area, you might miss something outside of that area that's occurring because you're only seeing what's in your field of view. I agree. Those are both really good points. One of the things I will say about that tiny dot is a lot of people think that that tiny dot or very tiny reticles or things that are very precise are actually better. But when it comes to like combat style shooting, sometimes that can be too much of a good thing. Right. Yeah. You actually sometimes really need that reticle to be very prominent and obvious for you to be able to use it uh, under time duress. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the field of view is huge in that regard, and I would agree when I look through this, because as you're moving, you can absolutely kind of have, you don't lose as much of a situational awareness that you would with a lot of other optics that have a much smaller field of view. Right, and like for example, at the Rio Black Rifle courses I used it on, in a way, I liked the lower magnification of being on four power with that big field of view yeah. better than being on six or higher, yeah. because it made going target to target to target so much easier. Nothing new under the sun when you look at almost all of the combat optics in World War II mm -hmm. and a little past World War II, they were all 3.5 or 4X. The ACOG was originally 4X. It's kind of a sweet spot. Right. Yeah. So in overall, would you recommend it? I think it, it for the price point and the features it offer, 
uh, it's a it's a good option. Mm -hmm. um, if they do a product improved version, I'd like to see either a bigger center dot or daylight illumination. Either way, that would kind of remove that that gripe for me. Because okay. if it was actively illuminated, the dot could be smaller mm -hmm. for use in the daytime. If it's not going to be actively illuminated, like bump it up, you know, to one M away, and I think it'd be fine. Did we buy this or did they send it to us? Uh, they did send it to us. So this was a T&E &E model. Yes. So in full disclosure, this was provided to us to do this review. But overall, if you're interested in a stacked optic solution, ACOG-like, with some of the exceptions that you just heard, for example, the reticle being a little too small in dynamic environments or that brightness not being enough for this environment, if you're okay with that and you're okay with the bottom primary optic being Chinese manufactured, this sounds like a good to go option. Yeah, I mean, the best feature of this is its field of view. Mm -hmm. I, I can't overstate how great the field of view is and it's kind of worth those trade-offs um, for that quicker target transition and um, you know being able to observe things better and as you said you can bracket it in the horseshoe anyway You're right so once I got used to that aiming system I, it was fine okay well first of all thank you Sig for sending this to us for us to do this T&E thank you Russell for doing the work and actually putting this on the clock in a way that we kind of hopefully I, I kind of think InRange is one of the few channels that really puts that amount of effort into every optic review and that's you get some real world knowledge from that you can't really get that even what I just did just shooting at the rock there that's a real minor uh, take on the thing you actually put it on the clock and that's when things really show up So I wouldn't have noticed as much about that dot for example except for doing what you were doing with it So thank you for that and thank you for everyone out there in patreon that makes this possible because while you didn't buy the optic Being out here in these environments and the ammunition we're using to do this Which of course is more and more a problem in the current situation in our uh, state of affairs right now um, It's because of patreon supporters uh, and viewers like you uh, even though sig sent this to us They are not a sponsor of this channel them sending that to us does not provide a guaranteed good review, and you know that if you're a viewer of InRange. If you'd like to consider supporting us, you can find us at patreon.com slash InRangeTV. If you can't, I understand the other really big thing you can do for us is help fight the algorithm. Share this video with your friend. Thanks for watching.